Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. It's beautiful outside, so we appreciate you coming indoors for us for a few minutes. Sydney. Hello. <laughs> We've known each other a number of years, and we're finally getting to sit down and publicly discuss your work after so much time discussing it you know, behind the scenes. This is so amazing to be here today. It is, and I'm not nervous, nervous at all. <laughs> Good. Um, so of course we want to talk about the exhibition, but I think before we jump into that, maybe we should talk a little bit about your practice more broadly. Okay. Um, something that is very clear in this exhibition, but throughout your practice, is how you treat the figure. So of course you're a figurative artist, but you're very intentional about what figures you include in your work. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like why you're so deliberate about which figures you choose and what that means to you? Um, I'm so deliberate, or I am deliberate, about choosing my muses or the people that I paint because I want to bring humanity to my work. You know what I'm saying? Like if I just use them as models or a subject, it kind of changes the dynamic and the feeling of my a painting, if you know, in my opinion. So um, everything is personal. So I want it to feel personal to the viewer as well. So if it's super personal to me, then I, I feel like people will receive it the same type of way. Um, something that I'm seeing new in this work, I think, is how you use mixed media. Yes. So, of course, I think most people know you as a muralist, but you have a studio practice as well, as we're seeing today. Um, and I know that while you were at the residency in New York, like that's one time where you chose to include mixed media in your practice. Can you talk a little bit about three th these three works across from us and how they work together and why you chose the mask the way that you did? So um, I'm just going to back up just a little bit about to talk about the, the catalyst for the show. <laughs> Um, so the piece in the back, this large piece um, with the t-shirts, um, I originally painted that as a mural down in Miami back in 2021 December during Basel. Two days after I completed the mural, it was destroyed by vandals. Like they even covered up my name. Like it literally didn't exist two days after I got home from Miami. The mural was completely gone. So my idea that came out of all of that anger was, you know, like, fuck it, I'll just paint it big and it'll go into a museum. I didn't know how I was gonna do that, <laughs> but I was writing a proposal, writing down my ideas, and like a few weeks later, I got the invitation um, to apply for the ISCP residency in New York. So while there um, at the residency, um, I started that piece, piece, which is actually a mural that I did originally for Essence Fest back in 2019, the, the mask in the middle. Um, but it was a generic good idea. It was a great idea for a corporate little two-day thing, you know what I mean? Um, so when I was evolving it while in New York, um, I wanted to make it more intentional. Um, so I decided on, you know, making an African happiness mask because I didn't have an identity for the mask before, and I was trying to think, like, which mask would fit for us, black women specifically? And it wasn't the warrior mask, because I'm sick and tired of that trope. Um, but I found the happiness mask. And it spoke to me because the expectation of us, no matter what's going on in the world, is that we have to have a, have a look of pleasantry on our face. No matter what. Our babies could be dead right there. But you better not be frowning. You better not be, because then you get that angry black woman, da 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 fine, I drew these happy faces on all of these masks. I was angrily doing it too, and I just started sculpting. And then the more I started building out the mask, and I was like communicating with Backpack quite often, Backpack is my mentee, also an artist, like man, I feel like I'm really getting into this now, but this isn't the only mask, like everybody wears a mask. What would your mask be? What would a man's mask be? I was like, this, I don't think this is one thing anymore. It's, it has to be a triptych. And so while discussing with Backpack, I asked them, what would your mask be? And they said, hmm, it'd probably be made out of a mirror. Or, so, you know, I was like, that makes sense because they're non-binary, which is, and just the language alone is new for anybody of the 1900s, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's, it's this journey, but, They've been trapped in this body and now that they're free and so their unmasking is like a, it's just like a moment of just freedom. 
you know, so it's a different type of mask and it, because people still misgender them. That's why it's a mirror because I'm, I'm acknowledging you how I see you, not how you see yourself. So, but all of these different conversations until you get to the man mask, the black man mask, you know, the rules are simpler. Don't smile, don't cry. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could be angry though. You know, you mad, your mask is your workman. You know, so that's why it's like reflective gear, workman gear. The camouflage, it's also camouflage because you have to mask all of your emotions except that one. It's crazy that the only <laughs> emotion that they're allowed to showcase is the most dangerous one that we all have, and that is anger. So, and then of course the Adidas pants, because they also gotta be fresh, because this is still Detroit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> you gotta cloak it, but so that's, that's how that came about. Yeah. I, um, I appreciate you explaining each individual mask and being so intentional about how you chose the mask for your muses or your figures. Um, I think this triptych really talks a lot about the serving tea piece as well, the way that you talk about how black people have to wear masks when they're in public and they can't bring their whole selves to different situations. Um, and I, th I think like conversations that we had while you were at the residency and thinking about not just existing as a black person in this world and what that might mean and what we might experience, but the way that we experience tragedy that happens in the nation. So it might not be directly related to us or directly involve us, but we feel so connected to it because of the negative aspects that we have to experience here. And I think in the same way you're talking about those um, things in Serving Tea, because you, you, know, you have some text in the piece where you have some comments that people have made to you. Can you talk a little bit about maybe a few uh, quotes that you have in there and why you chose to include them? So the original piece that I painted in uh, Miami, um, the reason why it's called Serving Tea is I'm paying homage to Scheherazade W. Parrish, who does this Serving Tea, T-E-E -E thing, during Black History Month every year for the last, I don't even know how long she's been doing it now. And she wears, you know, like a, an educational T-shirt during Black History Month every day. I love day. those shirts. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're snarky, they're witty, but they're also educational, right? So when I did it in Miami, um, the t-shirt was designed, um, I drew, I painted the very first um, graffiti art. I was paying homage to her, but also to the very first graffiti artist of note, whose name is Daryl Cornbread McCray, who happened to, he's a black man now, but he was a black boy out of Philly. He was 12 years old and he was a foster kid and he, you know, would spray paint his name on anything. But he read in like a newsletter or a newspaper that his, um, it was an obituary with his name on it. And so people thought he was dead. And so what he did <laughs> was break into the Philly Museum and painted corn, cornbread on, on an elephant. <laughs> and he was, he was the first, but he was the first black, you know, he was the first graffiti artist to know. And because really the, the art of graffiti is really the act of graffiti is to be seen, right? So I'm paying homage to him and that's what got destroyed. So when I'm evolving it though, it's like, what is it now? And of course, it's like, it got destroyed, it got vandalized. Where is the black woman safe? Because it's not even in pretend. So I'm like, hmm, I declare sovereignty over my body, which is something that I actually painted um, for MTV live during the 2016 election. Um, like I, I uh, painted Johnny, who was in both paintings, and she was holding her crotch and then like holding out a sign that read, I declare sovereignty over my body. So I'm like, I'm reclaiming that. So I put it on that t-shirt and I was like, you know what? Let me build, I'm gonna build this, t this uh, skirt out of, <laughs> out of shirt and it's gonna say whatever, it's gonna say some terrible things that people have said to me. Cause it's like a call out, but it's also a reclamation. Like none of this shit that y'all said mean anything. Like it was hurtful at the time, but it was also fuck you now. Cause it's on, you made, but congratulations, you made the shirt. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, like one of the t-shirts, and it might be the first t-shirt like that you see, um, it reads, if you add freckles to this, it would be a self portrait. That was said to me about that painting right there in the yellow. <laughs> By, you know, an important person in an art institute, right? <laughs> so even those spaces aren't even safe <laughs> for black bodies, you know what I mean? Because while she thought it was cute or f 
or clever when she said it because it was like a aha on her face too, right? Like she was proud of that shit. Um, I, it's dangerous. But she also burst this peace right here in the middle, like, you know what I mean, which is called implicit bias training. Because, like, some people really just don't see us, and not seeing someone is a choice. You know, because if you don't see color, if you're one of those, oh, I don't see color, that means you don't see humanity. Because we all different shades. We got all different details and characteristics, and color is definitely a part of that. So if you don't see it, that means you don't see me at all. And that's a choice that you're making. So that's one of them. Another one was, you don't have any kids, so you shouldn't have that belly, <laughs> you know. Like, another one, one of my personal favorites, which I thought was funny at the time, <laughs> was I think I want to, I be thinking I want to put a baby up in you to keep you still, but the more I think about it, you'll just have my baby all over creation. <laughs> you know, and I was like, and I laughed at it like, yeah, because that's true, but it wasn't cute. When I repeated it, like, maybe a year later to somebody, I was like, wait a minute, this is really fucked up. <laughs> like, because it is a thing with men to keep women still by pumping babies in them, you know what I mean? So, but, so that's serving tea. I'm serving them up. Um, I think it's interesting how you discuss your personal experiences through your work and how everything relates back to you being a black woman and recognizing as a black woman moving through, not just the US or the world, but through the art world, um, like the name that you can make for yourself, the experiences that you've created for yourself. Um, and one thing I wanna talk about, because you make it very clear that you're from Detroit and that's mm -hmm. a big part of who you are, your identity, your upbringing, and that you know, had a huge uh, impression on you in terms of the work that you make now. So can you take a step back and kind of talk about how growing up in Detroit, um, going to CAS, going to CCS, how that impacted your work, and we can move into talking about the installation behind us and how your family is so important to you and has had a you know huge role in the work that you make. So my dad was a foreman for the city. He passed away in 94. Um, he was a foreman for the city. My mom was a social worker in the city, you know, both from you know different sides of town, but also my dad grew up in the North End and then they moved to Conan Gardens when he was 12. They, he actually helped build the house that ended up being like our, our house, because we still have the house, which was my grandfather's house, which is why he built the house. So all of us, no, nobody would ever be homeless because that house would be there. And Conan Gardens is special because it's the first, it's a historic area in Detroit, if you're not familiar. Um, it was the first area in Detroit where black people were allowed to build and own their own homes. So, and that's where I come from. Uh, that's where I still live. Like I bought a house four blocks away from my mama because that's because I always grew up around my cousins. I grew up around family. And even if we weren't blood related, you were still a cousin. Like it's still, and that's the beauty of this city. Um, Detroit is the city that taught the world, taught black people in the world how to strut. Because we even strut wherever we go. We can, I could be a whole ass Europe and I'll walk like I own the block. You know what I mean? Because we, it was the city where during the Great Migration, people could come up here and make the same amount of money as the next guy. Men could <laughs> make the same amount of money as the next guy. You could own your own ho house. You could have your own car. Like it's super blue collar. It's super get it done. It's super, it's like ownership, but not just ownership of stuff. Like we own our bodies here. And that's how, that's how I feel that the, what Detroit gives people that it don't give. You know what I mean? Freedom, like uh, autonomy. I, I'm about to mess up the word. Cause I'm about autonomy, to yeah. 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 <laughs> I agree with you. Um, Anatomical freedom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's something that you show very clearly in your work. Like you, you know, I've watched your progress over the years since the first time we met. Um, and I think you've become more and more confident in showing that in your work and making sure that the people that y you, you know, include as your muses feel very much like they're represented in the ways they want to be represented. And I think that comes from, you know, growing up in a place where you were taught that you can have confidence about being a black person um, and that you can have confidence about creating works that include, you know, black people. Um, so I kind of want to move back to this piece that's in the center while we're talking about um, some of your installations. And can you talk a little bit about why you chose to install it in this way as opposed to um, putting the paintings on the wall? So it was interesting. 
the first studio visit that Jova, Jova Lynn is the curator here. Um, she's the artistic director here. Um, the first studio visit that they had with me, Jova and M, um, on her way out the door, she was like, oh yeah, you should have something hanging from the ceiling. And then she just leaves, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, girl, I'm a fucking painter. Like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> But the more I thought about it, because I did want to paint the observer and the observed, right? I knew I wanted to like have a two-sided painting or something or a side-by-side -side painting with that. That's, I knew my self-portraits would be that. But when she said that, I was, you know, I, it turned into that. I didn't, I, I wasn't even in intending it for whatever was hanging to be this piece. But the more and more I thought about it and the more and more I lived, you know, I was like, oh, this is what I want to do and this is how I want to do it. And I want it turning slow. I actually had, I, this was a bigger idea too, because initially I wanted like workhorses around it and easels and I wanted people to interact with it like it was a live drawing class, you know. Um, and be able to do like gestures and stuff like that because of course it's turning so you only get a few seconds here and there but you know time and space and it would have been too much but <laughs> that was my initial because I wanted I wanted people to see me but I also wanted to feel like I'm looking at you from every angle of the room <laughs> you know what I mean like I got my eyes on you but you also got your eyes on me and the observed is mirrored because that's how we view anything that's how we observe everybody is observed and we also are observers and we do it through a mirrored lens we view people and interact with people based on our experiences dealing with other people and that's just the reality and that's why it's called implicit bias training and it's a question mark because i don't know if you've ever had to juror anything or judge anything or hire even if you're in hr and have hiring practices but they have you do go through this implicit bias training so you can erase all of the things that you know that you think you know about a culture or this 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 and that and that's and you're supposed to just judge blindly but the reality is it's not real because even though you instructed me to do that i still have this mirrored lens you know what i mean so and then you have the side panels this one in particular because sometimes people see us as in a body oh i know a body was there oh what they look like oh they had locks she was wearing black and these bright orange shoes and these this, these bright orange orange earrings, but that could be anybody, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot, but this it also addresses how the wrong person gets arrested and convicted and all of these other things. And then some people don't see shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? They do not see humanity at all. I don't even know. And the interesting thing, and I don't know if people pay attention to this, but I take away something in every piece. So this one, like it's a wood floor, you have the molding, but it changes in all the other pieces. Cause you only observe a certain amount of things. You might not be able to describe everything, how it actually was, you know what I mean? That's incredible. Um, I think that that's a really amazing piece to show just how your practice has grown. Um, Cause you're, this is a message that you tell throughout a few of your pieces, talking about how as a black woman, you know, you feel invisible sometimes, even when you're hyper visible. Um, and you're showing this very concretely, I think through this piece to show, you know, I recognize that I'm being observed. But I think too, you're, you're taking ownership in a sense, you're taking up space and you're showing, you know, I'm still here, even though you don't see me. I'm still here and I'm still making work and I'm gonna keep doing what I wanna do as long as I want to. Um, so I think, you know, I was really kind of taken aback by that piece. I think just seeing the difference between um, the works on the wall and having, you know, an installation. And I think, you know, physically taking up space in this particular gallery because you're the first black woman who's had a solo exhibition in this gallery of MOCAD. Um, can you talk a little bit about just how that makes you feel? Like, and talk about, when you first got the call to do this, to be able to have this gallery, what were your expectations or what did you want to accomplish and do you feel like you accomplished that? So honestly, me being in this gallery was not intentional. Um, it was kind of, it had to because, <laughs> so I'm working on these large pieces, which was in my proposal and the IAC, because with the ISCP residency came this show. Um, Rashawn Rucker, had his, he was an, a resident prior to this and his show was in the smaller room right here where the truck is. And that was the intended space for me. But as you can see, that wasn't gonna work, right? <laughs> um, 
so, but Jova made sure that they accommodated my needs and everything because honestly, when I first got the residency that was to attach myself, <sighs> see, this is that Detroit arrogance, baby. I <laughs> I thought I had this whole building. <laughs> you should have. I, like, I thought I had this whole building. I was making plays. Because I thought initially the house was going to be in that room, and then you walk around and all this other stuff. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't even, like, you didn't give me no stipulations, and I ain't going to make up none for myself. So, <laughs> but I, I, as a lu luxury law would say, I did what needed to be done. And I was, and I did it because I had to do it. I didn't know, I don't know when the next time I'm gonna have this opportunity is. Or it, I don't know when that's gonna be, so I had to go as big as whatever my brain told me that I could do. Um, and whatever my pocket said I could do too. So, you know, and like the pieces also are, you know, they're adorned and pressed. And all of that was done by my best friend, my mama, my best friends, my other best friend's mama, and my department head of cash tech, Marion Stevens. Like, so every piece of this show was a labor of love. From the house, to the mirror, every single piece. I love that. I love that you've taken the platform that you have and brought so many other people into it and given them opportunities to participate in the story that you're telling. So not just through the figures, but also through the making of the pieces and, you know, allowing people that are important to you to be a part of that making. I think that's, that's really important and that's really unique, I think, in an artist's practice. I needed them. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the piece that's behind us. So like I said earlier, a lot of people know your murals. They've seen them, you know, not throughout, not just throughout Detroit, but throughout the nation. And um, some people would say this is kind of a separate practice. You know, you have a studio yeah. practice and you have a mural practice. Why did you feel like it was important to bring your mural practice into this space? And talk to us a little bit about Yolanda and why it was important to represent her in this way. So I wanted to paint a mural because, A, that is a big part of my practice. And I honestly treat them the same. Like the systems and processes for both are which I learned at Cass Tech. <laughs> like, I can't even give that to CCS. My systems and processes, I learned in high school um, at Cass Technical Art. I was a part of the Cass Tech Art Department. <laughs> and um, I wanted to make sure that all of me was shown here in this space. It, and that's why I'm glad she was so large as well. So Yolanda gifted me a pair of these earrings. She is the creator of this V earring. She gifted me a pair of these earrings for my 40th birthday back in 2019. And I am a person, if you believe it or not, that does not like pink, right? <laughs> but I wore these earrings every single day for like a year. And when I got commissioned to do um, the Coma building, um, I presented them with two designs. One was like a play on like a Jeff Mills album cover, right? And then the other one was a play on the girl with the pearl earring, but I switched it out with the D because the D means Detroit, right? And so that's the one he chose. And, and the crazy thing is it elevated both of us, like because of it's so massive. Um, she, was struck, she was battling cancer for, I wanna say at least five to seven years. And um, I hope it gave her the boost, you know, that she needed at the time, but she passed away um, November 1st last year. Crazy thing is, when I um, asked her mom, could I do this, and I talked to a, a, a mutual friend, she's like, you know, Yolanda always wanted me to paint her. And I felt so terrible because I wish she could have died. You know what I mean? But she passed away November. She's the, you know, um, she didn't have a funeral because she didn't want one, and so, I had them, when they prepped the wall, use chalk paint so people could have an opportunity to give their two minute remark, but on the wall. So, and I'll be making a high quality print to give to the family um, so they can have it, you know. Um, I think when you first told me that story, I felt like this is probably my favorite work that you've done so far. Um, and so much because I know how important she was to you, and I know that you wish you know, she would have been able to see this or you could have created work while she was alive. Um, 
But I think the documentation of this and even the experience of being able to write on the wall and all these people coming through means so much for her legacy and her life. And I think too, um, you know, people are influenced by you without you knowing it. <laughs> and people are really impacted by the work that you make. You know, everybody doesn't always come up to you and say it, but I think there that I would imagine that Yolanda, you know, saw the work you were making, even if it wasn't her face. She saw Detroit people, she saw black women, and it was really important to her, you know, for her to continue supporting your career. Um, and, you know, we can see ourselves in these works. You know, we don't have to be the person that's there. We can see ourselves because um, we have a lot of the same, you know, similar experiences. Um, and in relation to that, I don't think I ever told you this, but um, you probably for don't remember, but before we met, you did an artist talk with Ty Sawyer. And I think it was at the Museum of Healing or something like that. This was when I was like oh a graduate wow, student. This was back in the day. I was a grad student. I didn't know anything about the art world and the art world didn't know anything about me. But you know, I knew where I wanted to go and I was working towards that. So I came to the talk because I was fans of both you and Ty. And during the Q&A, um, you know, I raised my hand and asked a question and I asked, did you feel a responsibility to the black community? And I kind of feel like this is maybe a silly question now, but at the time, you know, I was a grad student trying to sound smart. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I asked, did you feel a responsibility to the black community? Did you feel a responsibility to create black or to represent black people in your work? And your answer was something to the effect of, and you said this with, you know, all the personality that you have here today. Um, you said something like, no, I absolutely do not feel a responsibility. And you told me, like, you create this work because you want to. And I think the confidence that you had in that answer really impacted the career that I've had so far. And I would say, you know, as a person who has a similar background, we went to the same high school, you know, I'm from Detroit. I, you know, walked through this world, you know, I look very similar to you. Um, we have a lot of the same experiences. And so to see someone who looks like me, who has the same background, who can walk through this art world, who is dominated by people who don't look like us and have the kind of confidence that you had, I think like really had an impact on me and makes me be able to, now that I'm in my career, walk through this art world with that same confidence. So in terms of Yolanda, you know, like I don't know what kind of conversations you had with her about the work that you create, but I do think that you have a huge impact on so many people without really realizing that's happening. Thank you, and I'm sorry simultaneously. <laughs> so I wanted to take that to just lead into talking about, um, you know, how important community is to you. Talk about, you know, you mentioned earlier that Backpack is one of your mentees, but I think, you know, every time we see you doing a mural, it's always a group of other artists with you. You know, you always bring people with you, and that's something that, you know, I've read in articles, we've had conversations about. It's important for not only you to have that confidence and have that success, but for you bring people with you and make sure that they're confident in the work that they're creating. So can you talk a little bit about why that's important to you? Marion Stevens, uh, she's an artist. Uh, she's a matriarch. Many of us here um, are here because of her, like Mario Moore, you know what I mean? Like even Sabrina. Um, she's best friends with uh, Shirley Woodson Reed, just that, you know. But she says she was the department head of cast, and she says, if you keep it to yourself, you cheat everybody. You, we're not supposed to keep it to ourselves. You know, I never wanted to, I didn't like being the only one. I was the only one for a long time. Because even if black women did, were like in the school, or whether it was CAS or CCS, they still didn't paint as aggressively as me. And they were, you know, doing cute like flowers and more crafty stuff that they weren't like, we weren't in the same boat, I couldn't relate you know, um, and I didn't, I didn't like that feeling. I don't like going into spaces and I'm the only one. Like, of course I can handle it, you know, but it's still not comfortable. <laughs> it's not my preference. But also, I know we're out here because that, that makes it looks, look like we don't exist, but we do exist. We're all over. And if people want to learn and they're willing to learn, I'll teach them because I can't keep it to myself, you know. And I'm going to be working regardless because some people think if they teach you too much or if I teach you too much, you'll be taking my job. Take some of these jobs. I'm tired. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and it's like, um, and I've said this and I really mean it. Like, my masterpiece are really my mentees because they're like, Backpack is painting at a level and they don't have college. I'm their college. They got CCS through me. They got CAS through me and through their own efforts, you know, 
learning and practicing and doing and doing and doing. They just had a solo show at Cranbrook Museum last year. Like, they're moving and, and, and growing. So it's not like my mentorship goes nowhere. Like, they really, I'm, they're, I'm putting them out with the wolves, and they're making it. And then they're taking on mentees. And that's what it's about. It's about the paying it forward. Like, I think when people think pay it forward, they think monetarily. Like, oh, I'll pay for this coffee. I'll pay. That's, that don't mean shit. Because they already can afford the coffee because they already in line like you. You know what I mean? But paying it forward is paying it with kindness, paying it with teaching, paying it with learning and listening. Because to be a good teacher, you have to be a good student. And so I try to, that's really my biggest part of my practice, too, is the mis mentorship aspect and the not even opening up doors. I really want to blow the doors away. Like, fuck a table, fuck a door. Like, just space, like safe space. That's all we need, you know. And that's exactly what you've been doing. You can see, um, you know, not only through this show and through your work with Backpack, but other mentees. Um, oh yeah, Jane are killing it too. Yeah. She <laughs> um, but I guess before we close and take questions from the audience, I would say, like, um, in, a, in relation to that, maybe talk a little bit about Blackout Walls. Like, you were very particular about creating that program. What was the reason behind that? I had been, my first experience with mural painting in a festival was through murals in the market. I painted them for like commissions and stuff, but that still wasn't like a big part of my practice. Um, so murals in the market came 2015. Out of 50 artists, 25 out of state, out of country, 25 here, there were only five black participants. This city is 82% black or 85, it might even be more because we don't be filling out the census like that, you know? So <laughs> um, it was kind of, I didn't even know that world existed. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know it was a thing. And I'm like, oh, this is a thing. So I'm meeting all these international artists. They famous, they've graced the cover of Just the Pose, which is big shit, you know what I mean? So I'm meeting all these people and they're, and they're teaching, which is why I love street artists because it's always sharing. It's always teaching amongst each other. If a new cap come out, they're, oh man, I got this new cap. Look, this is how you do it. You know what I mean? It's always sharing. And, but I was still, it was still very lonely. So I was like a token for like four years. Like, and I would talk to these people like, hey, you know this artist, I met this artist because I started traveling doing it too. But it was always the same thing. I'm either the only black person, but definitely the only black woman, right? And so, Back in 2019, I'm painting out in Denver. It was three of us there, <laughs> right? <laughs> Myself, Max Sansing, Thomas lives there, Detour. Um, and we just had a discussion. And I'm, a, I'm aggressive and impulsive. So the discussion was, man, we really, I'm happy to see y'all here. We need to have our own, yeah. And I was like, yeah, we should have our own. And they're like, yeah, we could come back here and have a retreat and talk about it. I said, we're going to have it in Detroit. <laughs> and we're going <laughs> to, like, I promise you, I got back home. I hit up, I had, who did I have? I hit up my um, Presby cohort, Jean Elster, and I commissioned her to write my proposal. And then Blackout Walls, our inaugural festival, 2021 in Detroit. Since I wasn't having a meeting about it, because we was just going to do it. <laughs> and it's coming back this year, right? Oh, yeah, it's going to happen in September, September 7th through the 17th. Um, and it's a smaller festival. It's only 20 artists, um, 10 traveling. Only 20? That's a lot. Well, Murals and Mark was 50. <laughs> you know, like. A lot of black artists, black and brown artists coming to the city, though, to paint. That is true. That is true. And the first year, they killed it. And it was like a family reunion. And it was dope. And I hope it's even better this year. Well, thanks for your answer, Sydney. Before we take questions from the audience, I just want to say, you, you know I love you. You know I love your work. I'm so excited that we had this opportunity to talk publicly about your work and for me to just give you your flowers while you're here. You're a huge inspiration to me and a number of other artists in the area. And we're just grateful to be alive while you are, while you're making amazing And I'm proud work. of you and your journey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thanks for being vulnerable and sharing your answers with us and talking to us about your practice. Um, if anyone has questions from the audience, we'd love to answer them. Don't be shy. Y'all ain't got no questions for me. <laughs> Oh, yes. So, these two paintings are like my rich auntie series. So, that is artist Lakila Brown. 
She's from Detroit as well, and everybody painted is from Detroit, is a girl raised in Detroit, or a supporter of a girl raised in Detroit. Hi, honey. Um, <laughs> she's a sculptor, and she makes, she's known as the cultural archaeologist because she makes molds and sculptures out of like door knocker earrings, um, things that represent the African American without having an African American body present. So, collard greens, okra. She has, like, she built, like, this, uh, she sculpted this cornucopia out of collard greens, corn, okra, and maybe, like, a few other things. And so, and she was in New York. She lives in New York. She's been there for 13 years, and that's who I spent most of my time with while I was there. So we would walk around the city and have conversations about all of the decor and, like, the fertility symbols that's in everything on buildings and we would have discussions like, what would the African-American still life be? Like, if you take out Eurocentricity, oh, Eurocentricity, I can say the word. You know the word. But if you take out Western culture, what would we just be? You know, what would our still lives be? Because still lives really were paintings about wealth, to show off wealth. You know, like, oh, because these people, you're in Europe. You've never seen a mango before, but I got this painting of a mango and these grapes and all of these things because it shows wealth. So I was really thinking about, like, what shows our wealth? What shows us? So I'm having her, she's having dinner with herself, with her sculpted self. And her, her sculpture is like the centerpiece of the table. Lakila Brown. Maybe talk a little bit about how that piece is mixed media as well. Oh, yes. Those are real collard greens. Yes. So, under like, and it's interesting because I didn't put, like, a heavy, heavy coat of the acrylic gel on top of the, the greens, the actual greens peeking out, and you could tell that they're aging still. But really, um, the acrylic gel free, freezes it in time. So, even underneath, like, the texture, they're, they're real greens. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? You know what? I be reading those posts and stuff. Nothing. Because honestly, I've been an artist since I was three. Like, it was never a question. It was never, the only pushback I got was from people outside of my house. But my mom and dad supported me, my aunts. Um, was an artist, is an artist, she's right there behind you and my person. Um, so I always had support. Um, it, was, it was recently an interview on 1A, I think it was last week, um, and it was about a woman who just wrote a book, Women in the Art World, Women in Arts Without Men, or the World of Art Without Men. And the discussion was female artists and women artists throughout time and history and she was talking about how she had never even heard of a, uh, or learned of a woman artist until she was in college. Like, that was something foreign to her, because, you know, you learned about all of the men. But that wasn't my truth. Like, because I, I didn't start off in an academia way as an artist. I just was that. In church, like, my aunt was an artist, and so, because she was a painter. I, I remember just looking at her paintings just in her room at church. This woman who was, like, the musician at the church, was a sculptor. She used to sell her stuff for like $800. I was like, messing around. I was like, oh my God, you can make all of this money, like just being an artist. And then there was another woman artist at my church, Betty Keys. She was a painter. She did these immaculate like watercolor drawings. So when black women artists was never, it was never a foreign concept to me. And, but the outside world is really what shuts a lot of artists down. And I, that's not a, even a color line. Like, oh, you need to have a backup. You need to have a real job. It is a real job because it's real work. This is physical work. It's like white collar and blue collar at the same time, you know. So I don't have any advice for me because I had the support I needed. But I got advice for other young people, and that's just do what you're doing. Draw hands, you know, practice your shading, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, go to museums, buy the art books, look at the YouTube, because this is a different time. We didn't have all of this. Like, these kids are coming out, and our scholastics didn't look like these scholastics, you know what I mean? Because they have access to all of these tutorials and learning how to paint, and, all, and they paint and do work immaculately. But, you know, the work is 
it's not just this work, it's the outside work too. Like, okay, how do you market yourself? But you also have IG, TikTok, social media. So you have opportunity and you can create your own opportunity. So that's what I would say to young people. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Carol Marie, so you don't have no question for me? Yes, because I forgot to talk about that. So, initially when I painted that painting, <laughs> that was not like a planned work. So, Juanita Anderson, who's a master filmmaker, <laughs> approached me about featuring me for her PBS American Masters in the Make Me series short. Um, I agreed, and once she got it, like she got the, the green light for it, she wanted to film me painting. I didn't have nothing to paint because I had just came off like a mural run. I just had a, a show with my partner. I didn't have anything to work on because, like I said, like I work kind of commercially back to back to back. Like I got this going on. I got to make it work for this. Move on. Go do a wall. Oh, I got another show coming up. Oh, make a piece for this. And that's how I was working. I didn't have anything to paint. And I was like, damn, what am I going to paint? Ooh, I've always been obsessed with this photograph. I might be able to tackle it now. And I can honestly say that's my first, I can see that as my, I feel that's my first, my very first masterpiece. Um, Cause it took me forever. I'm a, typically I'm a quick painter. It took me a year to complete that. Um, so thank you Juanita. While I was in New York complete, uh, you know, working on it. Um, I was thinking about my cousin because of course this is my family. My cousin um, Tommy, little Tommy, He's blind, he's going blind. Um, he has a degenerative eye disease. Um, I actually did a series on mirrors um, at the Red Bull House of Art um, because of him, <laughs> you know, inspired by him back in 2013. And his eyes are worse now. So I was thinking, how is he gonna experience this piece? Cause I want him to experience it like everybody else. I was like, oh, this is bigger than this piece. I'm gonna build a house. I'm gonna build a room by uh, my first I wanted to build a room. I wanted him to build a room that was familiar to him because that's actually my uncle's house. It still looks like that right now. Well, not now because I took out all the furniture. But, <laughs> but a few weeks ago, that's what the house looked like. Um, so because I wanted to walk him through it, and I wanted him to feel it. And honestly, I was thinking I wanted smells, I wanted food, I wanted so many other sensory things. So I also had a soundtrack cre um, created, um, produced which you can, um, you can get on the, if you click the, you know, the QR codes that are, they're pasted around here somewhere. Um, there's actually a soundtrack as well to go with this whole show, but specifically that piece. And you can really live the show through, through the words, the sound, and that room. And so that's why I was thinking about that. Thanks for your question. I think we have time for one more question if anyone has another one. Valerie. Um, I'm going to see Beyonce in Amsterdam. <laughs> and that's my, and I have a, a wall coming up in St. Paul, Minneapolis. Um, that's next after Beyonce. And then planning for blackout walls and whatever comes in between that I feel like saying yes to. But I feel like the, this is, should be the year of no, right? Right? <laughs> but Beyonce.
here and there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carol. We're definitely very appreciative of the work that you're doing in the art world as well. Amen. Um, so thanks, Sydney, so much for talking to me today and answering everyone's questions. And if you haven't had a chance, definitely go through the exhibition and get close to the works. There's a lot that you can't see when you're far away from it. Um, thanks all for coming out today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.